Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us on BIF Connect. My name is Kyle Fosner, and I'm the Executive Director of BIF. I'd like to start by giving thanks to the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations for their continued stewardship of the ancestral and occupied lands on which we live and work. BIF is committed to honoring the land and its stewards by collaborating with and supporting Indigenous artists, filmmakers, curators, and audiences. Celebrating showrunners, directors, writers, producers, and craftspeople, the VIF Talk series brings you the very best key creatives working today. Whether they're responsible for critically acclaimed films or groundbreaking TV series, our guests provide a treasure trove of information and inspiration for fellow creators and, of course, the fans. The VIF Talk series is supported by Creative BC, and our community broadcast partner is TELUS. This year's talks will take us behind the scenes of some incredible films, including The Many Saints of Newark, My Name is Polly Murray, The Green Knight, Suicide Squad, Flea, and Stories That Transform Us. We'll also look at fantastic small screen works like Mayor of Easttown, Rutherford Falls, Family Law, and British Columbia, An Untold History. A very warm welcome to our guests and to our audiences. Enjoy the show. Hi, my name is Matthew Hannum. I'm your host for the evening, and I'm reading. I'm reading something. Um, this masterclass is presented by IATSE 891 and supported by Creative BC. Viff is thrilled to host this talk with Fred Raskin, the editor of Suicide Squad, and um, so am I. I'm very excited to be doing this. I'm a big fan of Fred's work, and I have been for a long time. Um, he's got an amazing resume, and um, the Suicide Squad film you know, is what we're talking about. And we're gonna focus on that, but I wanna to touch on, you know, a few other projects. So Fred, you got anything to say? <laughs> Thank you, that was a lovely introduction. Um, no, I'm really happy to be here. Ask away. Um, yeah, so so um, I guess what I wanted to start with, because James Gunn's films are, and you you know, you, you've been working with him for some time now. Um, they're, I mean, I think they're completely singular in tone. I don't think there's anyone, you know, I, I would say that if there's somebody close, it might be Tarantino, who you also work with, which uh, I think is a really interesting thing. Um, and for, But, you know, in regards to this movie, uh, I would love to just talk about where you guys start. You know, um, are there tonal references and things that you share across all of your work that you've done together? Do you break it up from film to film? I'm just curious when there's something so specific, how, how do you guys sort of get, or at least maybe when you started, how do you get a sort of shared tonal vision to work from so you guys are communicating or you're on the same page? You know, it's funny, on, on the first Guardians of the Galaxy, which is the first time I worked with James as editor, I was actually uh, an apprentice editor. The, the second movie I ever worked on was a picture called Tromeo and Juliet, which, uh, which James wrote. Um, and uh, so, so that's, that's actually where we met. That was back in 95 in New York. Um, but the first time that we worked together as director and editor um, was on the first Guardians. And uh, for that movie, I asked him, I read the script, um, which I completely like, like I got pretty much from the first page. Um, it, it was, it was, it was funny, actually. It was something that I was a little resistant to at first um, because all I really knew about the movie going into it was that it, uh, it had a talking raccoon and a walking tree in it. Um, and it sounded like it, like it could truly be one of the greatest disasters ever made. Um, and, and, and like, I, I genuinely like believe that until I sat down and read the script and by like page 30, um, I, I, I was completely hooked. And, and by the end I had a lump in my throat and I was like, I just called James and I was like, I'm in, um, all, all my reservations are gone. Um, and one of the things that I, that I asked him, um, after I read it is, are there any of the, uh, the, the original Guardians comics that you would recommend I read um, in preparation. And he, he said, the Abnet Lanning run um, from about a decade ago is really strong. And I guess it's kind of where I based um, most of this, but you don't need to have read it. Um, like everything you need to know is in this script. Um, and I think the process of us working together, uh, he had a pretty good sense um, I, probably midway through production that I really got 
what he was going for. Um, like he was really happy with my cuts, um, kind of from the beginning and our senses of humor is, uh, are, are in alignment. Um, and, uh, and going forward, there really hasn't been anything. I mean, even when we did the suicide squad, um, you know, he said, this is a throwback to, uh, like the, the sixties, uh, world war two man on a mission movies. Um, but, uh, but but I don't think that, that there were any like I mean he he gave out a few examples but nothing that he, where where he was like you need to have watched this like this movie is going to be its own thing um, and stylistically um, the the way he went about shooting it you know is sort of like uh, he's like it's a war movie so I'm going to go more handheld and verite multiple cameras. Um, uh, which, which is kind of in marked opposition to a lot of the movies that he, that he cites as reference points. Like, Dirty Dozen certainly isn't shot that way. Um, and, uh, but he never, like, I, again, I know that he, uh, he based the concept on the original John Ostrander uh, Suicide Squad comics, um, but, but there was nothing where he was like, you, you need to have read these. Um, I think we've sort of reached a point now where, you know, I... I can read the script and have a, a pretty good sense as to what he's going for. And, uh, yeah. and I, I think that the work that I provide to him tends to show that. Right. Are there things that you find um, in your own, in your work, like across all of the films that you do, are there, are there, do you reference, do you just take it from this, from the movie? Like sometimes I find there's not like, we're like, well, I don't want to apply anything to this. It's telling me, like, do you ever find that you kind of are like, I need to like, I need to figure out some kind of thing to put on this, or does it usually come from the work? Uh, I mean, it, it does usually come from the work. I mean, sometimes there'll be little stylistic touches. Um, I, I've, I, I've had a, a couple of things. I think that there was something in the Suicide Squad, though I'm, I'm blanking on it right now, where we, we uh, it's certainly, uh, um, when we have to do flashbacks um, and uh, like, Rather than just cutting to uh, to, uh, to to the the flashback material, um, I'm I'm a big fan of camera stops um, and doing the effect as though a film camera has stopped, which is a effect that we rarely see these days because almost everything is <laughs> shot digitally. Um, and and in pretty much every time I've done this, it's been in something that was shot digitally. Um, but I, but I like um, using that effect, um, which is, you know, that's, that's, that's an idea that I'm bringing to it just because I happen to like it. Um, it, it's cool. something that, that isn't really referenced in the script, but in general, when I've done stuff like that, um, I think a lot of the directors that I've worked with have been, uh, uh, you know, are big film people. And so they, they, they like the throwback feel to that. Um, that's cool. Is that something that you would, you like sort of think of, or actually, I mean, I guess that brings me to the, um, to something that I wanted to talk about, or I guess what are, I mean, I want to talk about assembling a film and then the, the sort of iterations that you go through on your own. And then what happens, you know, obviously things change a great deal. So we can, you know, I'm, I'm curious about your assembly process, how much creative development you're doing on your own. Like, are you, what do you focus on? I've had so many different experiences these days, the film I'm working on now, we're not going to look at an assembly. Sometimes we look at it and then start over. Sometimes you work from the assembly. Sometimes you never change the assembly. Like, um, I'm curious when, when there's something that is so, where the style is built from the ground floor, when you're assembling, what are you looking for? What are you focusing on? And, and like, how do you, when you have an, a new idea that comes from the footage, where do you find the best like how, you know, do you log it? You know what I mean? Like, I'm just curious your process as an editor mm -hmm. during, like before, like in prep, do you think about something in assembly? How do you look at it? And when do you introduce that into the director's cut? Sure. Um, it's, it's a really good question. And uh, of course, it, it depends on the movie and it depends on the sequence. Um, you know, in something like the Suicide Squad or Guardians of the Galaxy movie, um, you've got like the big action sequences, um, at least the ones that involve like spaceships and giant walking starfish, um, like that stuff is all heavily pre ahead of time. Um, and for James, uh, like filmmaking is 90% preparation. Um, so he pre 
it until it is uh, like he has he's completely locked in onto what the sequence should be. Um, if there's anyone uh, watching who's not familiar with what previs is, uh, it, it's basically. Um, uh, computer generated moving storyboards um so a representation of of the shots um that will be that will ultimately be photographed but done in cg like it basically looks like a video game um and it, it, these shots are used to uh so that the visual effects team can figure out how they're going to accomplish what they need to accomplish it also helps the director figure out how he's going to shoot something um and uh and so when we're doing these big sequences, uh, like a, a healthy amount of the work is done before I ever like get dailies. Um, I'm, uh, don't get me wrong, performances affect everything. Um, but when it comes to the, like the big wide shots, like they're all fairly established. If there if there's a shot of a, of a giant starfish um, walking through a city street, um, that's going to be in the previs, and that's probably going to live in the previs until uh, we get to the point where we're sending it off to the visual effects vendor. And so it's a combination of of uh, like I'm cutting the dailies, but I have to integrate them into the uh, the previs that that exists. Um, w when it comes to a more traditional dialogue scene, um, I'm really completely on my own and uh, uh james um actually not not unlike quentin um is is one of the few directors i know who makes it a point to uh to at least attempt to watch dailies every day um so uh on the suicide squad uh at the end of every shoot day we would we would meet in the in a screening room and uh and and i'd have uh, my notepad with me and we'd watch the dailies now we wouldn't I mean, he was shooting anywhere from like three to six hours of footage per day. So we were not we were not sitting there for six hours. Um, we would probably get through that amount of material in about 20 minutes because we'd watch the last two takes of any given setup and he would frequently high speed through some of it. But it would be enough for him to give his thoughts like the, the intention is for this to lead into this. And this. Um, so that that's uh that, that's sort of the first part of the collaboration and then uh and then i go off in my room and and uh i i watch everything thoroughly and and uh, uh and and put locators on the stuff that uh that that, that I, most appeals to me um and then i just kind of work from my gut and and put it all together um and uh it, it, what's people ask me like how working with a filmmaker like Quentin Tarantino differs from working with someone like James. And uh, with Quentin, he doesn't enter the editing room at all during production. Um, uh, he's he's completely focused on shooting. Um, so I'm really like, I'm basically on my own for the entirety of production. And one of the nice things about that is that uh, I can always move forward. Um, because it's always, I get it to the point where I'm happy with it. And then I move on to, to the next thing, um, uh, with a movie like the suicide squad that is so heavily dependent on visual effects. Um, I don't have, uh, like, I, whenever I finish a cut, I have to send it to James, um, and he's going to give me his notes and it has to be refined to the point where, um, uh, it, where he's happy with it. So that then it can go off to the visual effects vendors, um, and uh, like that is that's always in the back of my mind, um, which means that frequently, uh, in addition to dealing with the four to six hours worth of dailies that are coming in, um, I, I'm uh, I, I have to go back and address notes on earlier sequences, um, and so uh, it, it is a much more challenging process. I mean, which is why ultimately there were two editors on the Suicide Squad um, because it was it was just too much material and too many too many notes um, to, to to make that happen. Um, in in that in that part process, I just want to ask. Um, how much are you, are you like, sometimes I find it a challenge when I'm working, when I'm keeping up to camera and cutting the dailies. If I want to ask for something, I really, it's like, you know, sometimes I have a struggle or, or, or like calling, like saying, like, I'm not sure we got it. Like how much of that is happening um, in a, in a film, like say in a film where it's really heavily previs, like you're saying, is there a difference between that experience and then, you know, a more traditional, like dramatic experience where you're just like, I think we need like another angle here or whatever. Like, do you, how do you go, how does that process work for you? Um, 
in, in a heavily previsd environment, um, it is very rare that we need something that we didn't get because it was all dictated by the by the previs. Um, in in a more dramatic situation, yeah, that it, it can happen. Um, and I mean, thankfully, I, I, I've worked most of the filmmakers that I work with. I've worked with multiple times, and so I'm not shy about saying I think we need this. Um, I, having said that, I don't do it that often. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm, 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 I, I am fortunate enough to, to work for some, some pretty talented filmmakers. Um, and, uh, it's pretty rare that I find myself needing to say, uh, I think we need something that you didn't get. Um, it, it, it just doesn't happen so often. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's an interesting, it's a nerve, it's nerve wracking, right? Cause you're like, part of it is like, I don't know if I don't get it. And you already have a plan and, I, and I'm exposing myself, but you know, sometimes anyways, I'm just, I was always curious. I'm always curious about that. Um, and so something that happens, I find is, you know, inevitably, inevitably in films varying from director to director, some things just don't work. Some things have to get cut. Uh, a lot of people I think don't realize how much gets cut from so many films, how many good scenes, scenes that are, you know, at what point in this process, again, and I'll stop saying in a film like this, that's previs, because I, you know, it's a big deal previs. It takes time and people really get to think about everything. Right. Um, when, what was it like, at what point are you a introducing things that you're not sure about? Like, you know, maybe I want to, I think this scene could go because it was, you know, because when I was looking at it or how long, how long do you find it's healthy to wait before you start sort of excising things or changing things around? Like, do you work through the whole movie? Do you do it in sections? How, how does that work on a movie like this? Um, well, again, I think having ha like having worked with James a few times, having a relationship with him, um, I, I, he, like if I, there, there was a scene during production that I was like, look, I'm going to be honest, I don't think the scene is ever going to make the movie. Um, and, and I think, uh, I think James was a little surprised to, to hear me say that. Um, uh, and I just said, look, in, in the totality of the movie, it's not really, it's not contributing to story, it's not contributing to character, and it's not contributing to atmosphere. So I, 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 I don't, I don't like, I don't see a world. And, and also, it's doing like it's doing something that another scene in the movie uh, accomplishes successfully um, in in less time, um, and and uh, I don't know if it even made our first assembly of the movie um, because I like like James's initial reaction was was no 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 we can't cut that and then he came back a few days later and was like well maybe we can and then by I mean by the time we looked at an assembly it was gone um, so I, I mean it will happen that early. Um, Having said that, like, you know, it is it is a very collaborative process. And as we get deeper in it, like into the cut, once we're, we're looking at the director's cut um, and refining it before, like, we're going to show it to the studio. Um, uh, James is very focused on on making the best movie that we possibly can. And uh I think perhaps uh, in part by, by virtue of the fact that he was is both the writer and the director, um, he is maybe less precious about stuff than, than you might think. Um, he's like, like if, if, if a good scene is interrupting the pace of the movie, um, he's like, nah, I, I'm much more concerned with, with, with the movie being paced properly. Um, and as a result, uh, and this is something that you know I give him complete credit for. Uh, I, I I would say the funniest scene in the movie is not in the movie um, because it came at a point where we were we were being fed a lot of information um, and uh, and and it was it was it was in a, a big a big section of exposition and it just felt like this is one thing too many um, and we can afford to lose it. Um, and, uh, and it was, it's actually one of the few things that I was like, no, 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 you can't, you can't cut this. It's like, <laughs> it is legitimately the funniest moment in the movie. He's like, I know it is, but it's just, 
not really necessary. Um, and, uh, and, and it went away. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, th throughout the process, we, uh, like, like really from beginning to end, it's, it's, it's what can we afford to lose? Or like, we want to make the best movie possible. And, and we will occasionally try to cut things that, uh, where, where we're going too deep and we take it out and it's like, Oh, okay. We went too far. Um, but you know, sometimes I, I find you have to actually go that far, um, to, uh, to, to, to know that, that, uh, what you actually need. Um, yeah, you need to get, you need to get to the point where you start to miss it. Right. Where like yeah. famously, I think it's on the criterion site when they were cutting video drama, I'm friendly with, with those guys mm -hmm. as a Canadian bo good Canadian boy. Uh, they Ron, the guy who cut that, told me that they they got so jazzed on cutting the movie that they they previewed it and it, and the things were like the 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 review card says doesn't make any sense like yeah. that was the review. <laughs> um, do you guys pre do you preview? How much do you preview a movie like that? Um, well, it, it, so th this is this was sort of a strange situation because this uh, all happened during the pandemic. Um, sure. Uh, like, and it was, uh, we literally, um, we finished shooting the movie. I, I believe February 28th was the last day of shooting. Um, wow. we got back, we got back from Atlanta and a week and a half later, we, we were working from home. Um, wow. and it became like, it was a big question. How are we going to do test screenings? Um, like, is there some way of doing them virtually? Uh, like, can we do it like, like an Evercast session, a zoom session, like where we can see people's faces as they're watching it and they don't need to be masked um but um what ultimately was decided upon it, it was i mean it was probably in uh i think maybe in july um or august maybe when we um th there were uh, we went to las vegas well I, I should say uh the movie went to las vegas um really none of the creatives were in attendance because we were you know, rather frightened for our lives. Um, and, um, but, uh, but movie theaters there were still open. Uh, and so they had a, a, a theater that seated, uh, they had two theaters that seated 300 people and they put 50 people in each of them. Um, and right. they did two like simultaneous uh, screenings where they had cameras on the audience um, and, they, and a microphone in, in, in the crowd. And, um, and, and we watched the video and had it sunk up with the, uh, the picture for the movie afterward. But, you know, half of them were masked. Um, like, we, we learned a few things about where people laugh, but it was not the most informative um, test screening environment. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I find testing to be very valuable under normal circumstances when you can sit in the room with the audience and really feel their energy. I mean, I think that is that's more important than any numbers or, or anything written on any cards that you're, that you're going to get after a, a screening. Um, it, it's really, and, and, and half of it is the way I feel as I'm watching, as I know other people are watching. Oh. Like, um, yeah. I mean, it's the same, it's the same as you know, if I finish a sequence and I bring uh, my assistants into the room to watch it, um, to just yeah. get their impression. Half of it is about how do I feel as I know other people are watching it. Um, like, Oh, totally. now I see how long this is playing. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't feeling that when I was it's, by myself. <laughs> isn't it amazing how, when you're alone, you're like, this is great. I'm a genius. And then, and then you show like just your dog and you're like, ah, what's up? What was wrong with me? It's so funny. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I feel I'm luxuriating in this because you have a lot of great things to say. But I, wh one of the things that I'm interested in is is talking about music and talking about, um, you know, your filmmakers all like you. Do you love music? Have you always worked with music? Uh, do you like? Uh, since we're talking about Suicide Squad, and maybe I'm interested to hear your experience and how it contrasts from, say, a Tarantino movie, which has a similar musical sort of philosophy, right? You know, it's like the songs drive the, and they give the characters their personalities. It's an amazing thing that both of these directors are able to do, especially thinking back to the first Guardians. That was, that was, that was perfect. Like, that's just a perfect music moment. And I'm curious at what point do you bring in music and at what point are the songs decided? Like, are the, you know, you know what I want to know, like all of that stuff. 
Right. So, so with James, um, 95% of the songs are actually in the script. Um, like he's, he, in fact, he's started like sending out Spotify lists to accompany your reading of the script, um, so that you can listen to the songs as you're reading these scenes. Um, uh, with, uh, like Quentin actually is, is a little bit more cagey about that stuff. Um, in, in, unless I hear it played, he usually won't tell me what he intends to use. Um, but, uh, uh, so I'm like, I'm, I'm not a musician. I am, I am a big music lover. And I think I do have a, a pretty good sense of, uh, like of time and pace and, and, uh, uh like, oftentimes I have to, um, like I'll, I'll, I will, we, we, we always have a music editor, but that in general, that music editor doesn't show up until, uh, after production. So I am frequently my own music editor during production. Um, and, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty good about, uh, understanding how a song can be edited, um, and where, where, like how to lose a measure here and a measure there and, and, and get it to work. Um, because it is, it's very rare that, you'll cut a cut a sequence and lay the music in and it will just line up perfectly um it almost always requires some some editing on some side whether it be the picture or or the uh uh or the 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 song itself um i think it's only uh, perfect when you don't intend it to be right like sometimes right. you put a song and you're like i never thought about that that's great you know <laughs> yeah no, no no i mean and that that's that actually happens it happens a lot with quentin where where like he's got a few ideas for a song and we'll lay it in. And one of them will just be like, the sync is perfect. And okay, that's in, that's, that's the song. That's what we're going to use. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, but um, I, I, I also, I mean, I, I'm going to get away from songs for, for a moment because like I said, no, I'm the interested in score are, too. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the songs are, are mostly in the script, but when it comes to temp score, um, that one is, is really on us. Uh, uh, you know, Guardians 2 was a little easier because we had the score for Guardians 1. Um, but, uh, but with uh, the Suicide Squad, actually, we, we knew that John Murphy was going uh, to be scoring the movie. And so we, like, he gave us a giant library of his stuff. And then we sought out some more stuff that he had done. And we basically, he, he was the composer who we used um, for, for our temp stuff. Um, as we were putting it together. Um, and, uh, and that section, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, now cutting the, uh, uh, the, the Peacemaker show, the follow-up to, uh, to the Suicide Squad. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we've, we've also, uh, if for there, we were able to use the score from the Suicide Squad, um, along with some right. other pieces though, actually he, uh, yeah, anyway, I shouldn't say too much about that. But um, but, um, um, but when it when it comes to uh, uh, to the songs, um, uh, you know, the, for example, um, the, um, uh, the 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 Harley escape sequence, the Just the Gigolo um, sequence, like that was that was written in the script that we were going to use the Louis Prima Just a Gigolo. Uh, it was it was never going to be the David Lee Roth version. I'm sorry to disappoint everyone, um, but. Um, uh, but I cut the sequence first, laid the song in, and then sort of found like where the choruses were hitting. And if they weren't quite hitting in the right place, um, I would edit the music accordingly. Um, like the, the first verse of, of that song, I, I did some kind of crazy editing um, where like, like I pulled out like the, the second and fourth beats of every measure, like uh, it's something that like it played invisibly. Like I was kind of like, am I ever going to get away with this? And the first time I played it for James, he was like, wow, that really lined up perfectly. And I was like, you didn't notice? Like, no. <laughs> um, That's and, and, and we had, we had a music editor, Jason Ruder, who came on um, during post and he was actually really helpful. Like I was like, I don't know how I'm going to get this to line up. Like it's not quite working the way I need it to. And so he did some, some really minor like speed ups and slowdowns um, yeah. to, to, to get everything to, to hit perfectly. But so, but it's, so it was, it was a big collaboration. Um, but I think, you know, having an understanding of how the music works uh, is very helpful in editing the sequence like that. Yeah. It's a real turning point, I think, in an editorial career when you, when you learn that you are not a slave to a song or a piece of score that's been recorded. I, I didn't know that for many years. And then suddenly I'm like, wait, 
wait a second, you know, you can do, it's like amazing that you don't know you're allowed until you do it. And then you're like, then it's like the cloak is pulled. You're like, whoa, everyone's messing every song up, you know, like walk me through a big action sequence like that. What, 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 are, what are the first things you look at, you know, like you cut it without the music. So you're looking at the, at the pieces, like, talk to me about it. I cut movies so, so, that have about 80 cuts in them, so, you know. <laughs> No, no, no. Um, you are exceptional at what you do. Um, but um, the uh, uh, one, one, I mean, one of the reasons why I selected this scene is this is this is one of a handful of them in the movie that wasn't previewed ahead of time. So this one, like, was really I was I, like I had free reign um, to, to do what I want. Like I, I, um, James shot pretty much everything in this scene with four cameras. Um, I think, with the, the exception of uh, like the what he referred to as the umbrellas of Cherbourg shot, the, the overhead of Harley spinning around shooting the guys. Um, but uh, uh, so, um, I mean, so much of it was really just kind of going with my gut and what feels the most exciting, um, uh, including kind of when we're transitioning from, from regular speed to slow-mo. Um, uh, like obviously that stuff uh, was shot at high speed, but we had the ability to ramp it up or down, um, depending. Um, uh, there, there, and, and there were some fun uh, little accidents uh, that happened, um, like when Harley cracks her neck at the beginning of, of the scene, like she shoots the first three guys and cracks her neck. And the neck crack is perfectly in time with the music. Um, and it's it, that, like, that was just a happy accident that occurred that I was like, well, that has to stay. And actually when, uh, I, I ultimately turned the sequence over to our music editor, I was like, but you can't change that because that has to, has to fall the, the way it falls. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, my, my first pass, I mean, this, this, so this sequence did not come together quickly. Um, th this was probably, this was, I I'm going to say between, between both the picture and all the sound effects editing that I did, because one of the things like, you can't present a cut of this without it having sound effects on it. Um, and I generally do my own sound work. Um, so for this four minute long sequence, I probably spent about three weeks on it. Um, before showing uh, my first cut. Now, I, I mean, it was shot over the course of, I think, two weeks. Um, so, um, so I went a little beyond uh, where I should have. But, uh, uh, um, but so, so for my first pass, uh, we didn't have any of the animation in there, like the flowers in, in the hallway, like the artwork and, and, and then the birds and all of that, like that all came later. Um, but, uh, we had a pretty good sense as to how it was going to play. And, and when, when we did ultimately get the animation in there, um, we did experiment with a few things like um, uh, uh, th there were, there were more animated characters and um, it actually, it got a little distracted. Um, it, it was, it was pulling the focus away from Harley. Um, and so just doing, uh, doing the little birds, um, ended up ultimately being enough, um, to, to give, to give the, the fantasy sense, um, that, that James was going for, like we're, we're in her head without actually taking the audience out of it. Oh, you're, you're muted. Real pro here, real pro. Um, I mean, let's also acknowledge that I'm talking to you from a rented Hyundai in Cleveland. Uh, anyways, I I hope they're done soon because the sun is down. Uh, anyways, uh, I'm curious. So one of the things that's interesting about a fight sequence is that you're dealing with stunt performers. You're dealing with VFX. You're dealing with practical effects. What's the balance in this? Like, what would you, you know, talk to me about the, you know, how much are you working around? How much are you adding afterwards? Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, obviously we're, we're flipping between Margot and her stunt double a lot in, uh, especially in, in the, the first half of the sequence. Um, but, uh, uh, in general, James shot, uh, he would shoot the same shots with the stunt double as with Margot. Um, uh, and frequently, I mean, uh, th there were plenty of occasions where Margot did it just as well. Um, and it was really only when it was most dangerous, um, when he would only shoot, shoot the double. Um, 
but uh, but but she did a great job. I mean, a lot of the stuff that you see toward the end of the sequence, um, where she when she's jumping in the air with the javelin, like that was Margot on wires. Like she's really doing all that stuff. Um, Amazing. And uh, yeah, no, she, she she's phenomenal. Um, and uh, in terms of visual effects, um, some of the squibs, the the, the bullet hits. Um, were were live on the day, um, and then a bunch of them. The, the slow motion ones toward the end, where she's machine gunning all the the guys down. Um, those uh, those were all added in post, or most of them were. I think there were a few live, but we added much more. Like for for the the, the slow mo blood spraying, um, that, yeah. that was all done digitally. Um, uh, but I th- I think uh, like the. She stabs one guy with a knife, and the blood spray there is CG. But when she cuts the guy's throat, um, that that was all done practically. Um, that was that little, was actually something. a little like knife thing. That's cool. I mean, yeah. it was almost. It's so good that I was sure it was VFX. You know? No, 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 no. That's that's real. Um, that's amazing. That, that was uh, the legacy guys um, did, did did an amazing job. Um, I mean, it was something that when we watched it the first time, uh, we questioned: Is this too gruesome? Like, is this going to take people out of it? Um, and uh, ultimately, we just decided that we liked it. So, <laughs> well, tell me how much how much of that because that's a very interesting subject. How much of that is um, changed when you add fun music? You know, like there's a real there's a real recipe at play there, right? Because it's horrific. Like it's a horror show in there, and it's brutal. Like. I mean, you know, the slamming the guy in the face, if that didn't have that music, you'd be getting like NC-17, you know? So I'm curious, how much adjusting do you do without music? Bef- but like, and how much, you know, do you take the music off and look at it without? Sometimes I do that where I'm like, is this too much butter on the toast? Like, is it actually good without the song? Like, how do, what's the balance on a long scene like that? Um, you know, in th- in this particular instance, uh, like we knew it was always going to have the song on it. Um, and so, right. I, I mean, I think I probably am the only person who ever watched the scene without music. Um, right. yeah. <laughs> um, like I didn't show it to anyone until I had the music in there. Um, right. And, every, and, and, you know, the music's working in conjunction with the effects uh, and everything else. So I, yeah, I mean, there wasn't, I don't think there was like, like the bashing the guy's head and and i think that's the same guy whose arm gets broken hideously um there's uh there's some pretty rough stuff but i but i don't think we ever actually uh question uh, like i don't think we ever really attempted to pull any of it out um it was we, we we wondered are we going too far and then and i think ultimately what we found is i think it's both a combination of yeah the music makes it a lot more fun um uh, it's a combination of that and you know we, we've just watched uh, over the course of a couple of scenes um this poor woman being tortured horribly like right she's she's you know <laughs> she earned it we, we're, we're, we're rooting for her <laughs> Yeah, we don't like these people. Yeah. So, she can hurt them, right? <laughs> it's 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 interesting. So one of one of the things that um you know we bring up here is VFX. Um, did you find o- over the course? I mean, your career has spanned what I would say is like the most impressive development in visual effects that we've seen you know like like if if you know the films that you were doing like the fast movies like you know that those started out as like stunt guy movies right and now they're full-blown vfx spectacle movies well i i i think they're more stunt movies than than you you might think um like maybe don't get me wrong they're not you they're not yeah they're definitely using cg to enhance certain elements but one of one of justin lynn's mo's is is he wants to shoot as much practical as he possibly can and i think there is right. stuff that under uh, like uh, uh, under a lesser filmmaker um might be decided to, let's just do it all cg um and, and right. he's like no I, I want the physicality of two cars crashing into each other um like it's something that is hard to to make look real yeah. i mean you can't you can't fake the real thing i mean i've seen really good but um i guess what i'm getting at is you know i find now even directors 
that normally would never, never want to do VFX are like, they'll just fix it. They'll just don't worry about it. You know, can we fix it's like insane things like can we put a different person in that car? Like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> what what has your learning curve been with VFX? Like, do you do you do a lot of VFX in your offline? Do you work with a VFX like do you do a lot of comps, even for just creative repairs, not like character work or anything? How, how, how has your experience with that side of the job changed or developed um, or not changed? I mean, we've, uh, I, it, it was like, like uh, Tokyo Drift, the third Fast and Furious movie was, was a big learning experience for me in terms of how these movies are made. That was my first experience working with Previs um, and, and then working closely with the visual effects team um, uh, and kind of understanding what is capable, um, you know, uh, I, and I think that movie ultimately had maybe 800 visual effects shots um, as opposed to something like the Suicide Squad, which I think is, it's somewhere between 1800 and 2100. I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's a lot. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, I, I, I think uh, like in, it, it, we, we've, we've got a visual effects editor on from the beginning um, and, uh, and I will frequently utilize him to do things that, uh, you know, like if I, if I, if I want to uh, combine two takes, uh, or portions of two takes or, or slip the sink on something, um, uh, I, uh, I, I am fairly terrible when it comes to doing my own comps. Um, so I will give my visual effects editor the most rudimentary picture in picture, <laughs> like, you understand what I'm going for here, right? And it's usually like, yes, I, I will make this look pretty. <laughs> so, and, and is that something you're doing in the assembly to sort of help you think about how you want this film to be? Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's just whenever, I, like this, this is a tool that we have and I, I feel like we should use it um, if, if we can. Um, like, like I, I wouldn't, it's not necessarily the first thing I'm going to go to, um, but, uh, but if they like, if it, if it, if it's the best way to, to solve a problem, um, I think that's the way to do it. Um, and yeah. you know, I, I, look, it, it, there are plenty of movies from, uh, pre 1991, um, where, where we didn't have access to, to, to uh, like all of the, these CG effects, um, and the ability to mm -hmm. do things this easily, um, where there, there's just tons of continuity errors. Um, and I think, uh, I, my, my gut feeling is that if you look, I think in the last 20 years or so, there's probably a lot less, um, For because sure. of what we're able to do. Uh, through comping, you know, you can use an over the shoulder shot that matches now, like you can you yeah. make pieces for it. Uh, so, so, um, uh, it, 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 it certainly worked. Um, you know, uh, continuity errors were, uh, were, were never going to ruin a movie. Um, but I do wonder how much audiences have grown accustomed to not seeing them. Um, because, because well, one thing don't actually, you know those, like, go ahead. Well, I was going to say what, one thing that we did on occasion in the Guardians movies um, is there are intentional continuity errors with the CG characters um, in the hopes of making them making them look more real. Um, like this oh, could wow. have happened while we were shooting it. So, um, Talk um, about that. What's that? What, like, do you have an example off the top of your head, or like the con? You don't have to say a scene, but like, what's the concept? Like, like Groot or something? Like making uh, it less yeah, perfect? like ro Rocket or Groot, like Rocket might have his arm up in in one shot, and, and the next cut, like it's down. Um, it, it's so, just something simple like that 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 you know will probably go by most audience members, um, but might aid in the idea that that this was an actual photographed element. That's really interesting. I mean, it is one thing that I struggle with. And I find, you know, because I work with a lot, of, a lot of people who are, I don't know, particular. And it's like, it, it, it's, it's something where everyone's like, no, I don't want it to be perfect. Like, it's okay, let's make this dolly move bump. Like, I don't want to, you know, I want to see it like the way they would have done it. And it's interesting, because when you do get like, when things get a little antiseptic, it's, it's funny, like you start to lose the guts or the grit of it right that, that's an interesting point um it's it's funny though um one of the things that i i do find is 
sometimes I don't know if you have had this, but you can get a little stuck on what's possible and you stop working with what you would have worked with if it, if it weren't possible, you know, or like uh, when I cut Paul Dano's movie, he, he wasn't comfortable with all that stuff. And, and he's an actor. So he really wanted to just go at the takes where I'd be like, ah, I could just freeze frame it, put the different take in there and then we'll do this. And it's going to be great. He's like, why don't we just watch the takes again? But do you find that that stuff is is something that you that changes from director to director like willingness or interest in or you know approach to fixing a problem um it definitely changes from director to director i mean i think i think a lot of the stuff that we're talking about like quentin would consider cheating um but uh but but james uh you know is, is like look his his feeling is whatever works the best um you know if if if, if we have to sp- split a take and slow it down and get it to, to, like, let's do it. Fine. Like, like what, uh, mm-hmm. what, whatever is going to uh, get the emotion of the scene across. Um, I mean, I, I, look, I think there is an element where uh, uh, like a continuity error is going to take the audience out of it. Um, and so you do kind of want to avoid the more glaring ones uh, if you can. Um, so uh, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a little dependent on the filmmaker. Yeah. You just mentioned something that is the lot. I mean, I think we're kind of getting down, but one of the things I wanted to ask you about, you, you, you said James is concerned about taking people out of the emotion of the scene. And I think that's one of the most special things about the work that you guys have done together is that they're, they're insane films, but they're fundamentally personal dramas. They're, they're comedies, you know, that they're, they're about friends and, you know, relationships with your parents and all of these incredible uh, basic Surrogate like, families. human things. Yeah, and, and they're misfits. And it's like, a, they're sweet. They're really sweet movies. And he seems to have a very sweet sense. And I'm wondering, oh, over these, these, these sagas where they, there are long running times, not too long, I never thought that, but uh, like, how do you modulate that? Do you ever have, do you, have you guys, do, do you do a lot of work where you kind of strip away the action and look at the family element or the, the relationship element? Like, how do you, or, or not that, but what are, what are the coping mechanisms when you have a movie with so many moving parts where the guts are the relationships? Is that a script thing? Is that an editing thing? Is it a previews thing? Like, how do you guys work on that? I mean, I, I guess it's all of the above, but honestly, uh, the, the heavy lifting, I think, is done in the, in the, in the writing stage. Um, uh, you know, I, like, like I say, when I, when I read that first Guardian script, uh, I had a lump in my throat by the end. Like, it, it, was, it yep. was really all there on the page. Um, and, you know, James executed it beautifully. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of... Um, I, there, there definitely has never been a time where we've said, let's watch the movie without the action sequences. Like, because, because that is actually sure. all like the idea is that they would all go together and we would see how it plays emotionally um, from beginning to end. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's just mostly it's all by design. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, sometimes that's just the case, right? Sometimes it just works. Sometimes it doesn't. I mean, I've, have you had a lot of, um, oh, I got a little message that we're ready to start q and I guess what I was going to ask is, do you guys modulate uh, things after, like, have you done a lot of, and in, in any, any experience, you know, I'm curious, sometimes you really have to, to make something play, you need to bring something new in, in the editing, you know, you have, and what are some of the tricks, like, do, you know, do you guys do a lot of ADR where you're kind of, you know, saying like connecting things or like, what, how does that work in the process for you? The sort um, of repair work? Well, so, so, so the repair work, uh, you know, under, under normal circumstances, like, like on the Guardians movies, uh, you know, Marvel builds in a period of additional photography. Um, like on every right. movie, they just know they're going to do it. Um, and, right. uh, and, and that is usually what you use that for. Um, Right. When you've got, uh, if, if you have a scene that isn't fully conveying what you wanted it to convey, well, you 
go back to the drawing board and figure out if it needs to be rewritten and reshot and then then you shoot it like and, and uh sometimes it's simple adr but in, in general uh, I, I, I mean uh you know adding adding uh lines of dialogue that are off camera um but but for the most part um it's it's stuff that is accomplished shoot through additional shooting however on this movie um because we finished shooting uh, right before the shutdown, um, they're, uh, they're really like doing additional photography was something that was never really entertained. Um, and it right. was really, what's the best movie that we can make with the material that we have. Um, and I, I think if we had had the opportunity to, to go and shoot more, um, the movie might be a couple minutes longer. Um, and, uh, who knows, maybe that hilarious scene might've found its way into a different place in the movie. Um, but do I think it, it would be a substantially better movie? No. I mean, I think it's, it still yeah. would basically be this movie. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how you feel in the middle of it. You're like, we need this. Oh, my God. And then you look at it it's like, I wouldn't have done anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the first question is um, from Jackie. And Jackie wants to know about managing stress. Um, she says, uh, you know, she, she finished a project that she prepped and and edited and did all the music herself. And I mean, it is something that comes up in our business, right? Um, how, how do you manage the, the stress of, of a production phase or post-production phase? <laughs> Not Crying. particularly well. Um, <laughs> yeah. Crying um, room. I try to exercise as often as possible. Uh, um, but, uh, but I, like, I, I gotta say, um, since the 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 pandemic and the work from home situation like like it, it has made it more challenging um and uh i i like i am uh, we, we start guardians three um in uh in a little over a month um and uh and, and when that starts i am actually going to be going into an office regularly which is something that i haven't done since uh since the shutdown um yeah. so uh uh and, and that honestly is part of it for me like like uh, just being able to focus um and and taking the time that i need to, to like to get some exercise and uh, uh, yeah, I, I am probably not the best person to answer this question <laughs> because I, 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 mean, I have, anyone who I have one, like the, the edit, the editing of the suicide squad truly was like me learning just how little sleep I was capable of getting and still functioning. On, <laughs> which yeah. is not something that I hope to emulate in the future. Yeah, no, it's real. I mean, it's, it's something that I think, well, I mean, we're all learning about stress, but it, it is something, I mean, about that question it's something that you really need to think about because it can it can wear you out and then i find i get like snippy with, with the director or with whoever and it's not good you know um the next question is is about being a bit more specific about working with the vfx editor um just like what that relationship entails overall um and and the, some you know whatever your thoughts are on working with vfx editors I mean, I, I will frequently use the visual effects editor as sort of my conduit to the visual effects supervisor, um, who usually has so much on his or her plate that, um, uh, that, that uh, like, I tend not to want to bother them. Um, but uh, any ideas that I have visual effects wise, I will convey to my visual effects editor. Um, uh, like, we want to add this in here or uh this graphic isn't working can we swap it out for something else or um uh, i mean i'm trying to think of, of a good example on the suicide squad and i'm drawing a bit of a blank now but uh, i mean it's really I, I i utilize the vfx editor for everything from like the aforementioned temp comps um f fusing multiple takes into in, into one shot um and uh, and and honestly just any like uh, a, a blue or green screen shot um get, getting the backgrounds in there you know you got a lot of stuff where people are driving and you want to get the backgrounds in so it feels real one, one of the things that um that actually has become um, uh, it's something that's changed kind of since I started working on these types of movies in the Fast and Furious movies. Like when we, when we did our first screening of Tokyo Drift for the studio, there were tons of green screens in there. Um, whereas uh, now um, what, if we're going to show the movie to the studio, there can't be any green. 
like like it everything yeah. needs to be filled in um and sometimes it's just the green is replaced with black um but usually yeah. it's we we want to have proper backgrounds in for everything um yeah so uh, like the amount of work that the team has to do has increased fairly dramatically um thankfully yeah. we have like with thanks to avid and after effects like we have the tools to do this stuff um fairly effectively yeah no it's it's a, it's been an amazing i mean i think also just crewing has changed you know, like, cause we used to just be like, it's all green. Like, I don't know. Like, what are we supposed to do? We can't do that. And now that the tools are up, we can do it, do it. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is about um, uh, having worked with so many fabulous directors. Uh, how many, uh, is, is there anything that, any notable takeaways that you sort of learned about filmmaking from these people? And um, what is something that every editor should know? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I think like, uh, it's, it's, it's a good question and I want to try to like narrow it down. Um, I mean, one yeah. of, one of, the, one of the big things, uh, that, that I've learned from Quentin is, uh, that really anything is possible. Um, like no matter how ridiculous an idea might seem, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in doing Django Unchained, we had, uh, uh, like there, there was a problem that, that, that we were trying to solve and he was like, and he had a solution. He's like, we're going to do a flashback to five minutes earlier. Um, we're going to, we're going to restructure something so that this, this scene is now going to show up. Uh, as, as a flashback, as opposed to in the, the linear order in which it was designed. Um, and, uh, you know, if you'd asked me a flashback to five minutes earlier, this is never going to work. This is a terrible idea. Uh, but, um, um, you know, what, one, one thing that, uh, that I have learned from every filmmaker uh, with whom I've worked and every experience I've had is that when someone suggests an idea that I am 100% certain is never going to work, 50% of the time it ends up working. Um, um, so like, you just got to try it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, you know, with, with James, I, I, I've, I, I mean, I've learned a lot in terms of um, kind of working uh, with musical sequences um, and kind of finding different ways to do things uh, on, uh, on, on the, uh, the, the new show Peacemaker, um, there are a number of, uh, of action sequences that are set to songs. Um, and kind of for the first time in my career, I've tried uh, laying the music in first um, as I'm assembling the picture um, and using the beats of the song to kind of guide the editing style. Um, and, uh, and it's had some really cool results. Like I've, I've found, um, there, there are ways to collapse a sequence that you wouldn't, you certainly wouldn't think possible if you're working without the music. Um, yeah. this is just a terrible edit, but once the music is in there, it works really well. And, and, and uh, and, and, and so it's been fun experimenting with that and, uh, and, and kind of expanding my own horizons. Um, and, and, and thankfully, um, having a director who's happy with the results. Yeah. What, and what about, what about the big one? What, what is something every editor should know? <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I really, I, 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 th I think, I think I actually answered it legitimately. Like no matter okay. how much you think something isn't going to work, stuff. like, it, yeah. it, 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 like you got to try it because so yeah. often it will like one thing, one piece of advice I would give is never, ever say the words that's never going to work. Um, because, yeah. because you were just going to end up looking like an idiot. Um, yeah. You're going to try well, it and it's going to work. You're going to be like, oh, <laughs> well, it's funny because I always, something that I always find is that it's like, if you don't think something's going to work and you go into that sequence or cut or scene or whatever, and you're like, this isn't going to work. We need to fix it. It's like the other person who's on the other side of that process usually the director is going to be like well i need to see that it doesn't work you know and so really what it's about is like you're always correct just do it and if you're right and it wasn't going to work then you're right you know and and that's fine but at least you don't have yeah. to prove it retro retroactively i mean it's yeah it's there, fascinating there, there is, part editing. It, there's definitely something to be said for um trying every idea 
um, just to know that you've explored that option. Um, and yeah. if, if it doesn't work, then at least you have the, you have the understanding that you've tried it and it didn't work and you know, so you never have this nagging feeling, Oh, Oh, if only I'd done this. Um, yeah. Do you, do you have any rituals for when you're finishing a movie? Like I know some editors who sort of were mentors to me would be like, okay, well, when you're, when you think you lock picture, go watch all the footage again and see if there's anything you left out or like, you know, which I've never had, I've never been able to do. It's, it's like, it's too, it's too fun. How much time but, do you have to lock? <laughs> couple of years i guess um no but i'm just curious like when you're finishing like do you do any is there anything that you find is helpful to sort of just say goodbye to the cut and know that you're done um <laughs> i i guess i don't i mean like i i have i have rituals of like always going on opening night with a bunch of my friends to see the movie um at, at that good. point i feel fairly confident that it's done um but but yes. no I, I i don't um I, no, I, I really don't. Um, I, you know, if, if, if the director is happy with it um, and I'm happy with it, um, uh, you know, if, if there's something where, because uh, oftentimes, I, look, I'm, I'm general, generally of a, a pretty like, like mind with, with, with my director. Um, but occasionally yeah. there'll be little things that, that, that have bugged me for forever. And like at the end of the process, it's like, okay, I just got to try this. And if it works, great. Um, and, yeah. uh, and, and if it doesn't, no one ever has to know about it. Um, and, and there've been times yeah. where it's, where I'll show something to James, like, uh, th this has been nagging at me. What do you think of this? Um, Oh, that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Put that in. Um, <laughs> you know, as, as, which of course will drive all the sound people nuts, but, <laughs> but, um, um, but you know, you, you w w our, our mission is always the same. We want to make the best possible movie that we can. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess like some, one of the things that I've had, you know, lately the past couple of movies, it's like you have two versions of a reel, you know, and you're mixing and you're just like, I don't know which one is better, you know, like, let's just mix it. And then we'll whatever, like, we'll put that in, you know. Um, um, so Aldrin says, can you tell us more about working on the opening sequence in Suicide Squad? Uh, like, uh the first, uh, like, like the, 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 the beginning through, I guess, uh, like, the other suicide squad through, through the main title sequence i suppose <laughs> yeah um, yeah i mean that was to me that was the thing in the script that really jumped out at me um as like this is this movie is doing something really interesting um and it's 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 much more clever than a lot of these movies generally are um the, i mean movies of, of this genre the, the superhero genre um the mm -hmm. the idea of setting up an entire team's worth of characters um only to kill off most of them um and to have it tight like and to not do it solely as the joke of oh we're killing them all off but also then to tie it into the larger plot um like it, it is yeah. actually a key plot point um th th like introducing team two uh uh just before the main title sequence kicks in um like i i i i just thought that was a real stroke of genius um you know in in terms of my own contribution, uh, I mean, the dailies came in and I cut them and hopefully did so effectively. Um, I mean, I think yeah. there were, there were things, um, when, when we, when we go back to the beach with Harley and Javelin, um, and uh, like the, uh, where we're kind of picking up where the opening sequence with them left off, um, we began that sequence kind of returning to the same score that we were hearing when last we were there. Um, so uh, uh, just kind of being aware of that, like uh, aware that we might be confusing the audience a bit and how do we, uh, like, how do we make this the most understandable that we possibly can? Um, and, and so in that instance, the music was, was uh, a factor um, and just kind of being aware of that. Uh, you know, there was actually, there was a sequence um, after, I think, uh, I think when when Team Two jumps out of the plane, 
Um, like, like we, we're, we're introduced to team two Waller gives them the whole talk in, in the, uh, the, the boardroom for, for, for lack of a better term. Um, and, uh, and, and, and sends them on their, their mission. And then we see them all jumping out of the plane. Um, and then, uh, and, and then they're, uh, they're walking up on the beach and, and the word now is, is, uh, is, is like blows onto the, the screen. Um, there was a version of that sequence where we saw this super quick cut, um, like as they're jumping out of the plane, we saw this super quick cut uh, recap of of what we'd seen uh, in the opening, the like the massacre on the oh, beach, um, yeah. done with, using um, different angles that we hadn't seen uh, the first time around because everything was shot with multiple cameras. Um, and it mm -hmm. was, it's kind of a fun way to say, okay, we're back here again. But it actually felt a little a little confusing. Um, and we're like, yeah, right. you know what? It, 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 every, everybody's going to understand this. And it turns out they, they did. So, so it wasn't something that was necessary. So we got rid of it. Um, that was probably the biggest change from how it was originally. I love, I mean, I love the opening. I love Michael Rooker. Like I love <laughs> Michael Rooker. I've always loved Michael. Like I think since mall rats, you know, and, um, I just think that is the most brilliant thing to cast someone so recognizable and and to make it feel like that's the star of the film you know i just think yeah. it was such a brilliant and i love that weird hair everything i love <laughs> one of my favorite bits is when you come back and he's and and idris is cleaning and he like finds his hair i really yep. really like that <laughs> so um, that was something that when we watched the dailies it was like are they going to know whose hair that is? <laughs> yeah. That's the thing so I, I always they're... find in movies is like, when you're like, oh, let's make this, it's like people get everything. You know, it's crazy. Like people are watching the movie and we're like, I want to know what this means. I want to know. It's, it's amazing. Um, that's it, my friend. We're all hey. done. This has been fun. Uh, that was such a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks so much. Thank um, <laughs> Viff, Viff thanks you. I thank you. It was a real pleasure to Thanks, meet guys. you. And um, I'm going to go do uh, some stunt driving. All right. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> um, thanks for watching. Thanks guys. again, Fred. It was a real uh, pleasure. pleasure. I'm uh, such a big fan of your work. Thanks uh, so much. Thank you. Right back at you. <laughs> Take care. Bye. Be well. Bye-bye.